Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the club and editor at large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to first welcome our members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before uh, introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, July 19th, uh, House Republican leader Dick Armey will talk about the uh, latest version of his flat tax proposal. On Wednesday, July 26th, uh, Jim Lovell, commander of Apollo 13, and Tom Hanks, the Academy Award-winning actor who portrays Lovell in the movie Apollo 13, will discuss the future of the U.S. space program. <laughs> and on Thursday, July 27th, Reed Hunt, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, will discuss, well, I'll let you figure it out, as his speech is entitled, Television or Televiolence? Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you'll find some cards at your table. Please uh, use those, write them on the card, send them up, and I'll ask as many as time permits. And now I'd like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to speak, uh, to stand briefly when their names are called. Uh, from your right, uh, Peter Schmidt of Education Week, Karen Kennard, contributing editor, telecommunications reports, uh, David North, managing editor, Aviation Week and Space Technology, Jennifer Mills, MIT senior physics student, Ken Eske, columnist for Scripps Howard News Service. Rebecca Vest, Dr. Vest's spouse. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Doris Margolis, editorial associates and member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. James McLurkin, a 1995 MIT graduate uh, in electrical engineering. Excuse me, good to have you with us. Annette Lasitra, Executive Editor of Education Daily. William Arthur, News Editor, Bloomberg Business News. Robert Boyd, Science and Technology Writer for Knight Ritter Newspapers. And Erwin Goodwin, Washington Editor for Physics Today. I also want to mention the contributions of Melissa Bender, Chad Taylor, Melanie Abdo Dermot, and Howard Rothman for their help in organizing today's luncheon. <clears throat> Americans continue to demonstrate their fascination with the accomplishments of technology. This summer, we followed the historic docking of the U.S. Space Shuttle Atlantis with the Russian space station, Mir. At the same time, movie goers stood in line to see Tom Hanks play the role of astronaut Jim Lavelle in Apollo 13. And as I said earlier, both will be with us next week. Nonetheless, on Capitol Hill, legislators are lining up to cut deeply into federal support for basic and applied scientific research and development, as well as education program. Much of uh, the nation's basic research is conducted on university campuses, such as the one headed by our speaker today, Dr. Charles Vest, president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Vest has earned the reputation as, quote, the unofficial spokesman for research universities in Washington, unquote. Since becoming the 15th president of MIT in 1990, 
Dr. Vest has assigned priority to shoring up the university's financial base, increasing the efficiency of its operations, and building stronger partnerships with industry. Dr. Vest is a mechanical engineer with degrees from West Virginia and Michigan universities. He has headed the President's Advisory Committee on Redesign of the Space Station, and he's also a member of the President's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology, the Council of Competitiveness, and the Governor of Massachusetts Task Force on Economic Growth and Technology. Uh, needless to say, Dr. Vest is not entirely happy with what's going on in Washington these days. There's a move in Congress to reduce funding for basic research, uh, civilian and, uh, and uh, <coughs> research and development by about 17 percent by the year uh, 2002. At the same time, a House uh, a sub subcommittee just voted to cut student aid and other federal education program by 18 percent starting in October. Uh, nor is Dr. Best uh, content with the state of education in America, as you will hear today. His address is entitled, In Search of Mediocrity. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm welcome for Dr. Charles Vest of MIT. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. I was informed that the National Press Club tends to like speakers who are high-profile politicians, well-known authors, public figures, and people with attractive bodies. So I lifted weights. I lifted weights all the last month, and I went out jogging five miles today, but this is the best I could do. <laughs> I do very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, I noted from the introduction that among the speakers that uh, will be addressing you in the near future are both movie actors and movie subjects. Coming soon, of course, the club will hear from Jim Lovell, the astronaut who commanded the Apollo 13 mission. Now, the Apollo 13 drama reminds us that science and technology are an essential part of the human adventure. But science and technology are not just activities for a few astronauts and academics. Science and technology affect our lives every day, and they create immense benefits and opportunities for all of us. Their progress over the past few decades has been every bit as dramatic as the movie that millions of Americans are flocking to see. What are some of these benefits? Well, you would expect me as a university president to have a catechism of these things to recite. But listen instead to what the chief executive officers of 16 major U.S. corporations said recently. In an unprecedented joint statement entitled A Moment of Truth for America, they said, imagine life without polio vaccines and heart pacemakers, or digital computers, or municipal water purification systems, or space-based weather forecasting, or advanced cancer therapies, or jet airliners, or disease-resistant grains and vegetables, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That and much, much more is what science and technology and our nation's universities have made possible. But today, rather than building upon this success, we are about to undermine it. The Congressional Budget Resolution proposes to reduce the budget for civilian research and development by over 30 percent. The long-term outlook is not much better in the administration's new budget proposal. Do we really know what this will mean for the advancement of the knowledge that fuels the American economy and creates a better quality of life? Our budget challenges would be simpler if we had such wisdom and foresight. And the issue of wisdom and foresight reminds me of the university president who was walking through the woods one day and looked over and discovered a tarnished, beat-up old brass lamp. So, of course, he picked it up and dusted it off with his handkerchief, and there was a flash of light and a puff of smoke, and a genie came out. He said, oh, master, you've released me, and therefore I'm going to grant you 
one wish, but you only have three things from which you can choose. I can give you infinite good health, I can give you infinite wisdom, or I can give you infinite wealth. Well, the president thought a minute and decided that as the head of an academic institution, he really should opt for the wisdom. So there was another puff of smoke and flash of light, and he sat down on a rock and furrowed his brow and put his chin on his fist and thought very deeply. Five or ten minutes later, his colleague reached over and shook him on the shoulder and said, well, say something. You're now infinitely wise. You've been thinking profoundly for ten minutes. Tell me something wise. Whereupon the president slowly looked up and said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> Well, the moral of that story is pretty clear. We will need both wisdom and wealth to meet the challenges of a new century. Because we live in an age of knowledge, knowledge is going to hold the key to our security, our welfare, and our standard of living. It's an age in which technological leadership will determine who wins the next round of global competition and the jobs and the profits that come with it. An age in which events move so rapidly that almost 80% of our computer industry's revenues come from products that did not even exist just two years ago. The cornerstone of our era, the information age, is education. Today, America's system of higher education and research is the best in the world, period. But will it be the world's standard of excellence 10 years from now? If the nation is to be preeminent a decade from now, if we are not only to compete but to lead, then we must sustain these unique American institutions, our research universities. Why? What is so special about our research universities? Well, first, the weaving together of teaching and research in a single organization gives us excellent research and it gives us superior education. Universities combine research and teaching to create vital learning communities. These are open communities of scholars who advance our understanding and introduce fresh and innovative young minds into the creation of knowledge, thereby educating the next generation of scientists and engineers, doctors and managers and so forth. And second, research universities are the very foundation of our entire national research infrastructure. Supporting the advancement of scientific and technical knowledge is an investment. It is an investment in the future of our human capital, that is, our people and their ideas. It is an investment in the future quality of life, health, and welfare of the American public. This two-part rationale was articulated just 50 years ago this month in a report to President Truman entitled Science, the Endless Frontier. That report presented the vision of Vannevar Bush, who had directed the nation's wartime science effort. That vision set a confident America on a search for excellence. And America has benefited beyond measure from this quest. Under current budget scenarios, however, we are in danger of disinvesting in our future. The cost of doing so, of drifting toward mediocrity in science, technology, and advanced education is simply one that is too great to pay. We must regain our vision, our confidence, and our will to excel. The federal government is rightly concerned about the budget deficit. It is making hard choices. We all have to make hard choices. But these decisions have to be based on a vision of the future and on an understanding of what hangs in the balance. Is a one-third reduction in civilian research and development really a savings? Or is it a body blow to our national innovation system, our future competitiveness, and our leadership? In the current debate, many seem unwilling or unable to retain, let alone enhance, our national excellence in science and advanced education. Instead of pursuing our endless opportunities, we are in danger of drifting toward mediocrity. This need not be the case. Indeed, it must not be the case. 
It used to be that universities and the federal government, in the White House and on Capitol Hill, and the voting public had a broadly shared sense of the benefits to be derived from investing in education and research. And they had a shared commitment to the future. This commitment is rapidly fading. Although leaders in both parties and in both branches of government are struggling to retain it, it is fading. Today, the future has no organized political constituency. Since the 1980s, when I began my career as a senior university administrator, I have seen an unraveling of the once fruitful partnership between universities and the government. Its fabric has been frayed, frayed by a steady onslaught of policy and budget instability, rule changes, investigations, and deepening distrust. Congressional hearings and media exposés on the reimbursement of the costs of federally sponsored research have tarnished the image of our universities. Most of the real issues have long since been addressed, but a residue of misunderstanding and of cynicism remains. At the same time, the federal government has steadily asked the universities to take on added missions and requirements without providing the additional resources to meet them. It is in this strained environment that the nation is now debating the future federal responsibility for university research in science and, and technology education. The issue before us simply transcends partisan politics. The issue is whether Washington budgeteers and decision makers have the political will and the vision to serve society's long-term need for new knowledge, new technologies, and above all, for superbly educated young men and women. Sometimes the debate sounds quite strange to the ears of this academic. During an important uh, recent markup session, for example, one congressman actually commented, I don't give a damn about the science, but I sure love the politics. Now there are those of us who would like to see those sentiments reversed. And this includes the American public. Recent polls show that nearly 70% of the American public thinks it is very important for the government to support research. And nine out of 10 want the country to maintain its position as the leader in medical and biomedical research. In fact, 73% are willing to pay higher taxes to support more medical research. What we need now is not a, pol a partisan political debate. What we need is to come together again in the best interests of the next generation. We are all facing problems to cut costs and become more efficient and effective in government, academia, and industry. Industry is doing its part by producing better, more competitive products, improving processes, reducing cycle times, improving quality, and meeting environmental challenges. The same intense competitive pressures that stimulated these changes, however, have increasingly focused industrial research and development on short-term objectives. Appropriately so. But research of a more general and longer-term value has been scaled back tremendously. Industry's nearly total R&D focus on rapidly commercializing products, when combined with the growing constraints on support of university research could devastate our national innovation system. It could well leave us without a shared, evolving base of new scientific knowledge and new technology. It could destroy the primary source of tomorrow's products, jobs, and health. Many Americans have long been concerned that we are mortgaging our children's future with ever-increasing federal budget deficits. Rightly so. We must not, however, foreclose on their future by failing to invest in their education and in the research that will be the basis of their progress. We must be wise enough to balance our priorities with both the present and the future in mind. <coughs> Such a balance clearly requires our research universities to transform with the times. I certainly recognize this. Our unique qualities do not exempt us from change. 
We cannot expect a 1945 policy to be applied unchanged in 1995. Nor can we expect in the universities to be exempted from intense budgetary pressures. But there are enduring principles that must be sustained. We must strike the right balance between holding to fundamentals and reforming ourselves if we are to continue our journey toward that endless frontier. How are we to do this? First, each member of the Education and Research Partnership must learn how to be more efficient, productive, and excellent. Industry has learned how to add value, improve quality, and become more cost effective, and it is significantly more competitive as a result. Government is struggling to do the same. Research universities must follow suit. At MIT, we have enlisted private sector help to re-engineer many of our administrative activities in order to improve our effectiveness and to reduce our annual operating costs by $40 million. There will be a corresponding reduction in the size of our staff. Similar efforts are taking place at colleges and universities all across the country. But we are also exploring exciting new ways to use new information technologies, things like the World Wide Web, to improve teaching and learning. Radical revisions in our engineering and management curricula to meet the needs of a new era are well underway. Increasing effectiveness is one thing we can do. Specialization is another. I believe that each college and university should focus more on what it does best. There is not enough money for every institution to do everything. We need institutional differentiation. Each of us, from community colleges to research universities, must focus our attention on where we can make the greatest contributions. Across the board reductions may be politically palatable, but they are likely to lead to mediocrity. We need to make tough judgment calls and we need to support the most effective programs. This isn't easy. But government at all levels and industry must make the decision to support excellence not to engage America's research universities in a war of attrition. Let's not do to our university system what we have done to our K-12 schools. Improving productivity, changing what needs to be changed are only partial answers to our problem. Even more important, I believe, is adhering to the two basic principles that have guided us to success over the past half century. The first principle is understanding that research funding is an investment in the future. A variety of studies put the return on this investment in the range of 25 to 50 percent. A more dramatic assessment is provided by my colleague Michael Dertuzos, who is the director of MIT's Laboratory for Computer Science. He points out that over the last three decades, the Department of Defense has funded university research in information technology to the tune of some five billion dollars. These university programs created by any accounting somewhere between one-third and one-half of all the major breakthroughs for the computer and communications industry. Today, these businesses account for five hundred billion dollars of the U.S. gross domestic product. Now, that is a rate of return on investment of at least 3,000 percent. Another measure of return on the investment in university research is jobs. A 1989 study by the Bank of Boston found that MIT graduates and faculty alone had founded over 600 companies in Massachusetts. These companies with annual sales totaling $40 billion created jobs for over 300,000 people in that region alone. Similarly, the Chase Manhattan Bank identified 225 companies in Silicon Valley that were founded by MIT students, alumni, and faculty. These companies recorded revenues in excess of $22 billion 
and accounted for over 150,000 jobs in that region. Similar stories can be told by public and private universities all across the United States. Remember this return on investment when you hear talk about the cost of research and education in the national budget debate. In the budget debate, it is important to remember a second principle that also has served us extremely well. Federal dollars for university research do double duty. They support the conduct of research and they educate the next generation. Here's how it works. Most graduate students in science and engineering are supported by federal grants and contracts that pay their tuition and enable them to attend university. In return for this investment in their future, these students perform much of the actual research. And let me tell you, the lights in their laboratories burn late into the night. They are working to pay for their education. Student involvement in research is not, combined, is not confined to the graduate level. At MIT, for example, nearly 80% of our undergraduates join faculty research teams. Their learning experience and their substantive contributions to the research are simply astounding. This blending of teaching and research is at the heart of America's research universities. For when you think of it, research is really the ultimate form of teaching and learning. Fred Terman, a great leader of Stanford University, who was a driver in the creation of Silicon Valley, was once asked whether he wanted his university to emphasize teaching or to emphasize research. Terman's reply was, I want this to be a learning university. In that simple statement, he captured the essence of our institutions. Now, however, this integration of teaching and research is at risk. Why? Because federal agencies are paying less and less the actual costs of the research they sponsor on our campuses. In order to make up the differences, universities are being forced to tap scarce resources that are not intended for this purpose. Now, this creates enormous pressures to increase tuitions, the one thing that we simply do not want to do. In addition, government regulations are increasing in both their magnitude and in their inflexibility. For example, recent federal regulations boosted the cost of our undergraduate research program, boosted it so dramatically that this innovative educational experience is in jeopardy. The linkage between education and research, the idea of research as an investment rather than a cost, these are vital principles that I believe we neglect at our peril. There are several other principles as well. Accountability for results in education and research, a commitment to access and opportunity, the free and open competition of ideas, and a dedication to excellence. Those young people with a talent to discover new sources of energy, to unlock the workings of the mind, or to find the cure for AIDS, will come from all strata of our society. Many require financial assistance. All deserve access to the best education we can provide, because all of us will depend on their leadership and their innovation in the decades ahead. Who are these young people who will lead us into the future? I'd like to introduce a couple of them today from MIT. First, I'd like you to meet Jennifer Mills. Jennifer, as you heard earlier, is a physics undergraduate from Portland, Oregon. In the summer of her junior year, Jennifer wrote much of the computer code that was used to take the data from the Hubble Space Telescope and create those stunning images that we all watched on our televisions when the Shoemaker-Levy comet collided with the planet Jupiter. And please also meet James McClurkin. James is from Baldwin, New York. 
James just graduated last month with an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and a minor in mechanical engineering. As a senior, he created this item I have in my hand. This is a tiny robot that we have good reason to believe will one day revolutionize certain kinds of surgery, enabling surgeons to operate inside the body without touching the patient directly. Now, these are the kinds of young men and young women in whom we, through the federal government, must invest if we are going to embrace excellence rather than mediocrity. Unfortunately, no organized political constituency protects the interests of our future. No interest groups fund telephone banks and direct mail operations to activate grassroots voters on behalf of investments in tomorrow. No political action committee invests in students like Jennifer and James. But every citizen will suffer if we are short-sighted in the allocation of our resources. If we do not invest in research and advanced education, we will not win the battles against polluted air and water, crumbling bridges and highways, infant mortality, Alzheimer's disease, or world hunger, just to name a few. So we all have the responsibility to become the trustees and the guardians of our future and the future of our daughters and sons. University faculty must continually enhance the learning process, and we also must do a better job of explaining to the public what we do, why we do it, and how it relates to their needs and their values. Industry leaders need to explain the benefits to the economy of research and development and their responsibilities to the entire national innovation system. Public policy makers need to take the long view, and they will do that if we, the public, insist that they do. And yes, the media also have a critical role to play by discussing the importance of these issues and by elevating the national debate. In many ways, it has been the end of the Cold War that has brought us to this point, a point of uncertainty and opportunity. We now must have the foresight and the wisdom to turn our intellectual powers to solving the problems of a new age. We must have the will to sustain our economic security, to eradicate the scourge of disease, create the jobs of tomorrow, lift the shadow of ignorance, and heal the Earth's environment. Meeting these challenges will require vision, confidence, and the will to excel. And it will require us to continue exploring the frontiers of the unknown. For the key to a vibrant future lies more in what we do not know than in what we do know. We must sustain excellence in research and advanced education. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Dr. Vest, you mentioned cynicism in your talk. You're going to get a few cynical questions first, and then we'll, we'll get a little easier as we go on. Uh, Nobel Prize winners and other top scientists always cry doom if spending for science is cut. They did so when much smaller cuts were proposed and enacted in past years. Yet science survived. Why should we believe these cries of doom now? Well, I believe that uh, the cry of doom is facing a 30% reduction in real costs by the year 2002. I don't believe that there has been any period in our post-war history in which we have seen a potential decline of that level. Now, I do not, as I've tried to emphasize in the speech, uh, believe that all of the issues have to do with budget cutting. I think there are changes that we in the universities have to institute. 
But the other thing that I, I really would like to point out as we think about the significance of this uh, question is that I mentioned what I called the American innovation system. The real danger is not just university research and just fundamental research. It's that in order to remain competitive in the world economy, our industries, one by one, have had to, and I want to emphasize had to, transform their own R&D operations to emphasize near-term matters. And as funding, if funding uh, continues to drop and we cease to do more and more of the fundamental research in science and technology, those two sectors will pull apart. And this very important layer of research that has mid-range importance, and broad importance across all of industry and all of science is going to disappear. And that really is the source of the nation's innovation. Why do you think a cut in it in the education budget is bad when the record shows that the more money we pour into education, the worse it has gotten? We now have graduate students who can't read their own diplomas. Well, I think that I, I may be a little bit it. of an overstatement. <laughs> and if they can't read their diplomas, I can assure you they're not graduate students at MIT. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, what we have seen, of course, is a bifurcation in our primary and secondary school systems. And I really want to say, as uh, is quite obvious in the, the two young people I brought with me today, that the kind of students who go to our top universities in this country today are as good and, I believe, better than they ever have been. But beneath them is a gigantic layer a majority, perhaps, of young men and women who have not received in the primary and secondary areas the level of education that they receive, that, that they deserve. The issue there, I would agree with the questioner, is not entirely one of funding, but it also is not entirely one that is independent of funding. I would challenge the view, however, that investment in our universities the sector of education that I know best has been counterproductive. I just simply do not believe that, although we must continue to try to be more effective and more efficient, and we are working very hard at that. I believe that investment in universities is well proven to have a high rate of return. I'm going to couple uh, the two questions here and see if I can make sense out of them for you. Uh, do you believe that colleges and universities should continue to provide as much remedial or catch-up learning for accepted students? Or is that really getting in the way of educating the other students uh, as a body? And secondly, uh, shouldn't that be the, the function of the uh, K through 12 public school education system? And what should we do as a nation to improve the elementary school system? Well, of course it should be the function of the primary and secondary system. Now, I mentioned uh, in, uh, in my formal remarks today that there is an importance of uh, respecting differentiation among institutions of higher education. And it certainly is the American tradition and the American way to educate broad swath of our young men and women. And unfortunately, in some areas uh, of the country, the graduates of our primary and secondary school systems who have the talents and ability to go on have not had the level of education that they deserve. And therefore, it certainly is the case that many of our public and private institutions of higher learning do have to engage more deeply in what we should think of as remedial work than should be the case. But the underlying issue, as the question uh, implies, is the state of America's primary and secondary education system. I do not claim to have the answer to this daunting problem, but it certainly is one that we have to find. I believe, unfortunately, and this is a personal opinion, that we probably have more an issue of a crisis of values and motivation in our society 
uh, and that really is a manifestation of that that we are seeing in our primary and secondary schools. Our teachers, dedicated as they are, are being asked to do jobs they were never trained to do and that they should not have to do, picking up a lot of society's broad problems. Nonetheless, we cannot give up. We have to win those young people one at a time. It's going to take involvement of industry and retired people and everybody who can give time and ideas to working together with our teachers to improve the school systems and above all to inculcate the kind of values that respect and understand the importance of learning for success in life. In the field of science education, we know a few things. We know that connecting science and mathematics to the real world as it's experienced by young people is very important in motivating them today. So as we have thought at MIT about what primary and secondary curricula need to do, we have built some ideas around ideas like how does a city work, where we start with the idea of trying to get people to understand, uh, young students to understand how the water gets into their tap, how the electricity comes into the wall, what all of this means, how it works together, and beyond that, to build an idea of systems, how entire systems like a city, or for that matter, like a school system work. And we've had some good uh, success in working with school systems along this philosophy. But I don't believe that we are ever going to completely fix that problem until we simply regain a stronger sense of the importance of the future, the value of learning across all of our young people. Uh, Dr. Vest, why has multiculturalism become so influential on campuses? And is it a positive or negative force in education? Well, multiculturalism, of course, is a politically charged term. And my view would be that it could be either a positive or a negative force, depending on how it's defined and, and interpreted. What I do believe, and I believe this very strongly, is that it is an important responsibility of our colleges and universities to build the diversity of their undergraduate student body and their graduate student bodies and their faculties and staff. I think that many of us simply do not have a visceral understanding of how rapidly, how dramatically rapidly, the demography of the population of the United States is changing. And while I don't believe in simplistic numerical quotas and things like this, I believe it is very important that our students better reflect the face of the society that is building around us. Now having said that, I also believe very deeply, personally, in the importance of Western values and the Western intellectual tradition. But they are not the only values and the only tradition in the world. And I do think that we have a responsibility to broadly educate our students to understand that there are different worldviews, there are different cultures, there are different histories, there are different perspectives. It, of course, can, and in instances has been, reduced to uh, sort of a uh, level of almost silliness, but I believe that operating at an appropriate level, recognizing the vast number of cultures that have contributed to the building of the United States and uh, to educate our students to work in the international context in which virtually every one of them is going to work in the future is very important. All right, we'll switch to research now. Uh, some voices in Congress are advocating that federal funds should support only basic research, not applied. Is this a good idea? Well, unfortunately, my view is that the sort of political tendency to define and box research into certain labels has not been particularly helpful. Not just the idea of basic research, but over the past few years, we've switched in a period of two years from an emphasis on strategic research, where that really means research largely with a pretty clearly foreseeable uh, application to the commercial world in a reasonably short period of time. We've talked about applied research. Now we're talking about basic research. Unfortunately, 
uh, this is not always helpful because research today is a continuum. It really cannot be divided into nice, neat chunks. And I think it is extremely important that in our universities, we engage in research that is uh, important in the fields of engineering and technology, as well as those in very fundamental science. Now, I think when one sits down and talks to the proponents of any of these points of view, you soon learn that there's much more common ground than one might suspect. Uh, certainly, the first, uh, first uh, goal of universities uh, in the research area must be to retain strength in the most fundamental development of knowledge. I would certainly agree with that statement. But it is also extremely important that we educate engineers and many of our scientists in ways that will be relevant to the world of industry in which most of them are going to be working. And that means also investment in engineering research, which is also of a fairly fundamental nature. So I guess the, it's not a simple thing to answer, but research really is a continuum. We need to pay attention as a nation to that whole continuum, and universities have a responsibility both in the most fundamental science and also the kinds of engineering that, uh, excuse me, the kinds of research that also prepare our engineers and scientists to work in industry. As you have said in your remarks, university researchers are typically federally funded. Yet when scientific researchers patent a scientific process or start a new biotechnology company, the government does not share in the financial rewards, even though it did support the researcher. In contrast, the researcher and the university often reap great financial benefits. Is this fair to the American taxpayer? Well, first of all, uh, I would not characterize things precisely as they are in the question. And I'm going to begin not as a diversion, but let me begin by saying that the number of university patents that have really reaped substantial benefits, the, using the term I believe that was used in the question, is very small. You can count them probably on one hand. We do receive modest benefits from a number of patents in universities across the country, including MIT, however. Now, our stance on this area, first of all, I want to clarify one point. If the federal government sponsors research and that federally sponsored research leads to a patent, the government has free use of that invention. We want to be clear about that. Now, why is it that universities in general, and MIT in particular, are pretty insistent on policies that allow us to retain rights to the patents that are developed even under uh, federal funding? Well, the clearest answer to that question is to go back and look at the data that gave rise to the Bayh-Dole Amendment, which really has, for the most part, governed this uh, area of the law. If you look at that, you will find that prior to the time that universities began to own the patent rights to things developed under federally supported research, those patents simply lay fallow. They were almost never commercialized, never exercised. And once the universities began to have uh, some level of control and responsibility for the patents, the amount of commercialization of these things rose quite dramatically. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, income for the universities, although believe me, we value that uh, when it comes about, but it really has helped spark the entrepreneurial system and commercialized uh, vastly greater percentages of the patents than was occurring prior to that. Several uh, questioners ask, well, okay, we're in a time where the federal budget is being contracted. Uh, why can't uh, money for research come from uh, private industry uh, or, or, or foundations and not the federal government? I'm glad that question was asked because it's a very important point. And I want to begin with a little true uh, anecdote. A colleague was telling me the other day that he had a very recent conversation 
with the CEO of a small high-tech uh, entrepreneurial company in California in the computer industry. And they were talking about investment, uh, industrial investment in R&D. And he said, uh, are you investing in any moderate to long-term research? And the guy said, of course not. We have to plow every penny we can in our R&D budget into things that keep us competitive and develop the immediate product. The rate of change is just too fast. Well then, who should do the long and midterm research? Well, that's the job of the universities. Do you support the university research? Well, of course not. Why not? Well, that's federal government's responsibility. And that's sort of the philosophy that we hear. Now, let me say that uh, at MIT right now, 20% of our research is sponsored by private corporations. It's about 80% federal, 20% private. And we hope that that will increase. But I do not believe it is at all realistic to expect or anticipate that uh, corporate support of research in America's universities will rise to the level of replacing 30% of the current federal budget or replacing even more of it. Why? Well, the primary reason is that I uh, talked earlier about the high rates of return on investment in R&D. Most, not all, but most economists certainly agree with that. But there is a hooker. The return on investment does not always accrue wholly or sometimes even in large measure to the specific organization that sponsored it. So company A that invests heavily in mid to long term research may develop a lot of concepts and a lot of ideas that help the whole system rise but do not uh, generate dramatic uh, financial returns specifically to the company. And that I think when you dig under the surface is the primary reason that corporations are not funding larger amounts of research in universities. My hope is that that will increase. I think it will increase not because we go with our tin cup in our hand, but because our educational programs, particularly in engineering and management and some portions of science, are going to be more oriented in the future toward the evolving needs of industry. And I think that will cause some increase in the flow. But I think we're a long way from the point in which uh, uh, private sector could actually replace the level of federal funding because it really is intended to make the whole system rise. What is your commitment to uh, areas of research that do not attract external funding? Well, that commitment is not nearly as deep as we would like. Uh, obviously, we do try to support research in uh, new areas that uh, may be so far out in people's thinking that they cannot uh, attract the classical sources of support for research. We particularly use what we can from our gift and endowment stream where appropriate to support the new young faculty members to help them get started and develop new ideas. But one of the problems that is really troubling me is that the financial pressures simultaneously holding the rise of tuition down uh, and seeing a leveling of both federal and industrial support is that it is causing us to so tap what few discretionary resources that we have that the money we normally use to fund these kinds of new ideas is becoming very, very scarce. We will, of course, of necessity and uh, recognizing its importance, try to retain some ability to do that, but it's becoming very, very difficult. I'm going to sum up uh, a number of questions and uh, I must say, uh, for, I don't wish to put your students on the spot, but you're invited to respond too. Isn't it about time that we required our research professors to do some teaching. <laughs> you or I answer it? Or put another way, do you feel that uh, there was too much emphasis uh, put on research and not enough on teaching while you were at uh, MIT? No, not at all. Uh, you'll have to come well, here, uh, please. <laughs> I don't think that that's been true at all at MIT. I know that as an undergraduate, 
all of the major classes that I took were taught by professors. None of them were taught by graduate students except small recitation sections. And I thought that that was wonderful. I hear of my friends at other colleges where things like that are not happening. I think MIT has done an excellent job with it. Um, all of the research professors that I know of teach at least one, uh, teach one class somewhere um, at some time during the year. So I, I haven't seen that to be a problem. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on teaching, but what makes it so special at MIT is that the people who are teaching us, um, I mean, you get your share of lousy professors that aren't very good at teaching, but they're still world-class researchers. You can go up to them and ask them a random question out of anything, and they've got an answer for you. Um, you can go see their labs, you can go look at their research. As an undergraduate, you can get involved in their research. And um, that has, has much more value than um, you know, a, a really good lecture, because now you get into you know, research is, is the edge of learning. That, that's learning where you're asking the questions and looking for the answers at the same time. So that, that's, I think, much more important than I shouldn't be saying this, but that's a lot more important. Um, a very valuable part of the educational experience. Thank you. I just wanted to close those wonderful answers with um, one caveat, and to be fair. One of the reasons that you pay the high level of tuition that is charged uh, at a private institution like MIT is because we do maintain a very high ratio of faculty to students. We are able to place great emphasis on teaching on the part of our faculty, and our problem in that regard, therefore, in fairness, is less than some of the very large state universities where it really is not financially feasible to maintain the same kind of ratio between professors and students. But nonetheless, I can tell you, as I know from meeting my colleagues around the country, that there really is a very palatable sense of recharging and reinvigorating the commitment to teaching, particularly on the undergraduate level across American higher education. Thank you, sir. Before we get to our famous final question, I have a couple of gifts for you. First, a certificate of appreciation for being here with us today. And secondly, a famous National Press Club coffee mug, which you can use to, <laughs> to drink coffee out of or collect funds on, on Capitol Hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> And finally, sir, is it true that MIT has more sports programs than any other university, but that engineers are afraid to play tackle football? <laughs> that statement is half true. <laughs> we do field, we believe, more varsity sports more varsity teams than any other institution in the United States. The only person who ever disputes that statement is my colleague Tom Everhart, president of Caltech. <laughs> Having said that, we most assuredly do play tackle football. I'd refer you three years ago to a remarkable article on our football team in Sports Illustrated, which is best known for the quote from our football coach who said, the interesting thing about coaching football at MIT is you can't really tell when the players have been up all night, but if they've been up two nights in a row, you can usually tell. <laughs> thank you very much, sir, for being with us, and we thank you all in the audience for joining us. Good afternoon.